welcome you here today. We hope your brief visit with us will be interesting and profitable to you as well. We'd like to talk to you about the Christian church, its beginnings and what happened to it following the death of Christ and the apostles. It's important to you and to me to know what happened to Christ's true church. During his ministry upon the earth, the Savior preached and established divine principles, teaching men what they must do to earn a place in the kingdom of heaven after passing from this life. Today, nearly 2,000 years since his mortal ministry, he is held in great esteem by hundreds of millions of Christians the world over, even though they have divided into numerous separate and differing factions. Yet when Jesus was born here on earth, he established but one mortal organization through which the divine plan for man's salvation could be taught and continued even after his resurrection. He organized his church. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul compares Christ's church to a building. He says the church was built upon a foundation of apostles and prophets, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. When he called his apostles, the Lord selected them personally and gave them authority to teach his gospel. As the Apostle Paul later said, no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Aaron was called by a living prophet, Moses, and given authority by the laying on of hands. The apostles were given divine authority, not only to minister in Christ's gospel, but to call others to the ministry, as Moses had done. Jesus chose other officers for his church, including the now little-known office of the Seventy. The Seventy were charged with declaring the gospel to the world through missionary work. The apostles and other officers of the church Christ established were working men, fishermen, tax collectors, tent makers. They were not paid for their ministry, but freely gave of themselves in serving the Lord. Christ also taught that as long as prophets and apostles remained as the foundation of the church, there would be continuous revelation from God to his people on the earth. For surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Since the true church in all ages has been guided by prophets who received current revelation, the church also produced new and additional scripture. As each new revelation was received, it was written and added to previously recorded revelations, thus becoming new scripture. In this manner, we obtained the Bible. The Savior told of a personal God, indeed his very Father in heaven, in whose literal image man was created. He revealed a loving personal God in the physical form of man, with whom, if allowed, man could talk face to face, as did Moses and other prophets of old. At the same time, he testified of his own divinity. He was indeed born to an earthly mother, yet he was the literal only begotten son of God the Eternal Father. To teach further that God was in the physical form of Jesus and other men, he taught he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. One of the signs that Jesus is the Christ occurred after the Savior was crucified. His spirit was reunited with his body. He was literally resurrected, as you and I will be. He showed himself to his apostles, saying, Behold, it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Other people were resurrected at the same time, and the Savior taught that all mankind would one day physically take up their bodies in immortality. Before he organized his church, the Savior demonstrated the divine significance of baptism by being baptized himself. His apostles later taught the necessity of all mankind being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Christ also set the example for the proper mode of baptism when he was immersed in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Baptism by immersion represents the burial in the tomb and resurrection of Jesus. As he lived among and taught the people, the Savior demonstrated the spiritual gifts of the priesthood he bore. This priesthood and these powers he passed on to others in the church. The gifts of healing, prophecy, discernment of good and evil, the gift to know God, the gift to work miracles, and many others. 
Before his crucifixion, the Savior introduced the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It was a simple ordinance with very little ceremony, but was highly significant. The broken bread symbolized his torn flesh. The cup was given to remind us of his blood shed for the remission of our sins. He commanded his followers to meet together and partake of these emblems in remembrance of him. It was also known in Christ's church that the gospel was to be preached to the dead. Peter said that after Christ's crucifixion, he preached unto the spirits in prison, even to those disobedient mortals who lived during the days of Noah. But he also taught that all believers must be baptized. Can the dead receive baptism? The Apostle Paul wrote that the living may be baptized in behalf of the dead. He mentioned this as proof of the resurrection, saying, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Baptism for the dead is another vital ordinance that was part of the original Christian church. Now, the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel as taught by the Savior included, of course, much more than is outlined here. But these are scripturally true and basic characteristics of the church. They should remain in the church, as Paul told the Ephesians, until we all come to a unity of the faith. But that unity of the faith never came during Christ's stay upon the earth. And the apostles who represented him after his death and resurrection were persecuted and eventually taken away. After the death of these chosen prophets and apostles came a break in the communication with the heavens and a loss of the proper understanding and use of the priesthood. Eventually, the priesthood, this authority from God to act in his name, became non-existent upon the earth, and the church as the Savior established it was lost for many centuries. The prophet Amos predicted this condition of apostasy when he warned, Behold, the day come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The Apostle Paul, speaking of the Savior's second coming, said, That day shall not come, except there be a falling away first. The Apostles, who were indeed the foundation of Christ's church, were not allowed to live. Although some of the original twelve were replaced after their deaths, eventually the entire quorum of Apostles disappeared. There were no known Apostles after 110 A.D. Living Christian prophets to whom God had revealed his word also were not known after the first century A.D. With the foundation of apostles and prophets removed, to whom the Lord had given divine authority, the church was never the same. As the apostles were lost, so were many other key positions, such as the 70. There is no known record of this special church office after the first century. And how could a man be called as Aaron, that is, by a prophet, when there were no prophets after the first century. By the fourth century, the lay clergy had become a thing of the past. Though the Lord said he would reveal his word through his prophet whenever there was a prophet on the earth, the general Christian world has no record of additional scripture after the first century. With the demise of the prophets and apostles, the vital principle of continuous revelation also became lost. In the second century, the ordinance of baptism by immersion, as demonstrated by the Savior himself, was changed. For the convenience of man, sprinkling and pouring were introduced, and some Christian religions decided that baptism wasn't necessary at all. In this way, the true symbolism of baptism was lost. From the fourth century on, the principle of spiritual gifts, such as prophecy and miracles, was virtually unknown in the teachings of most of the existing churches. Belief in a personal God was changed by the early fourth century. Scholars and clergymen decided that God was not at all personal, but was something without form or shape, something incomprehensible. The divinity of the Savior was accepted by his followers when he walked the earth. But by 200 AD, doubt was being spread by men who taught that Christ was a mere mortal nothing more than a great teacher. As the Savior's divinity was rejected by some, so was a belief in his physical resurrection, though he taught that the reuniting of body and spirit was to be universal. Many began to deny this principle even during the first century. Changes in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper appeared when apostles were no longer present to watch over the proper administration of church ordinances. 
From the fourth century on, the sacrament, or communion, lost its original character, and the form of its administration was altered. The beliefs that the gospel is preached in the spirit world to those who have passed on, and the performing of baptisms in behalf of the dead, faded away after New Testament times. They were unknown after the third century. But God has said that he does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Neither does his gospel change. His requirements for salvation are the same today as they were in the days of the apostles. Therefore, his church must be the same in organization, in doctrine, in divine authority. Latter-day Saints announce that God has made himself known to mortal men in these modern times and has restored his church in detail as it was anciently. Let's look at the identifying marks of the original church as they have been restored in our day. It was in 1820 that belief in a personal God was restored, as it was anciently, through a personal visitation by the Almighty to a chosen servant. Joseph Smith had such a visitation. Said he, following a most solemn prayer, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Joseph knew the father and son were two separate persons. He saw their faces and their forms. Later, the Savior, in speaking to Joseph Smith, said, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, your Lord and your God and your Redeemer. Thus, in 1820, belief in a personal God was restored to the earth, as it was anciently. Ministers must be called of God, as was Aaron. In 1829, John the Baptist restored the Aaronic priesthood to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. The Savior has said, A man must be called of my father, as was Aaron. That is, called by revelation. Since the priesthood was restored in 1829, most men and boys over 12, if worthy, may hold the priesthood in the church. In 1829, three former apostles, Peter, James, and John, restored the power and calling of the holy apostleship to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Six years later, a council of 12 apostles was called and ordained according to the Lord's pattern. And the holy apostleship is perpetuated here is the Council of Twelve Apostles, as ordained today. So we see the divine authority and apostles and prophets were brought back to the earth for our day, with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. On the day the church was organized, God spoke to Joseph Smith and said, Thou shalt be called a seer, a translator, a prophet, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The president of the church today, the 11th since Joseph Smith, is Spencer W. Kimball, modern prophet to give inspired direction to the church, and through whom men are called to the ministry by revelation, as was Aaron. The office of the 70 has been restored. These seven men preside over all who are ordained to this office. Anciently, Jesus called the 70 to assist the apostles, he did the same in our day, in 1835, saying, The seventy are also called to preach the gospel and to be special witnesses unto the Gentiles in all the world. As in Christ's time, the restored church has an unpaid lay ministry. Men and women from all walks of life give freely of their time, serving in many religious capacities. The true church has always produced new and additional scripture. Ancient prophets received revelations which were compiled and called the Bible. So it is in our day. Revelations are recorded and added to the existing volumes of scripture. From his first meeting with the Father and the Son in the Sacred Grove, Joseph Smith received continuous revelation. Latter-day Saints present three volumes of new scripture to the world.
even as Christ set the proper example being baptized by immersion, so must baptism be performed in our time. In modern scripture, the Lord has revealed what a priesthood holder should both say and do. Then shall he immerse him or her in the water and come forth again out of the water. This is a baptismal font from the temple, used exclusively for vicarious baptisms for the dead, spoken of anciently by the Apostle Paul. The Lord instructed Joseph Smith regarding this ancient practice in 1840. This sacred work performed vicariously in the temples is a distinctive feature of the Church of Jesus Christ, restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. The Book of Mormon, translated by Joseph Smith and printed in 1830, teaches the doctrine of physical resurrection of the body. The soul shall be restored to the body and the body to the soul. Yea, and every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Since the church was organized, gifts of the spirit have been exercised by men holding the priesthood. Said the Lord in our day, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall do many wonderful works. And then he lists the gifts of the spirit. Among them, healing of the sick, as we see here. In a simple ceremony at the Last Supper, Jesus broke bread and gave it to his disciples to be eaten in remembrance of his broken flesh. Then he passed the cup in remembrance of his blood shed for the sins of men. In many respects, this simplicity was lost through the ages. It has been restored, however, in our day. In a simple but solemn manner, the bread is broken and passed to believers. The cup is taken in solemnity also. The ordinance, being a symbol of Christ's crucifixion, is given to members of the church that they may always remember him and keep the commandments which he has given them. With reverence, Latter-day Saints everywhere testify that the Church of Jesus Christ has been restored in our day with all the blessings and gifts, with all the divine organization, with the authority and power given of God to validate his ordinances and to provide the true way for the individual to earn a place in the kingdom of heaven. I testify that these things are true.